Gatorade request where two college professors take a second look at questions and answers from around the internet and from you, the listener. My name is Professor Mark Sheriff. Twas the week before classes when all through the halls, not a professor was working. We were all on Zoom calls. The syllabi were hung on course websites with care, with two-thirds of the content definitely not there. The students were traveling back to grounds in just a few days, but we professors... We're still in a haze, so this week we offer our first live show. Okay, it's a Q&A lecture from not long ago, so listen as we answer questions with our usual wit and sass. And next week we'll be back, coming to you live from class. Um, so if, if there's any technical questions that you want, uh, by all means, you can post them in chat. We'll, we'll weave them in. We have our list of questions over here uh, on the sidebar. Uh, in the form, which uh, McBurney, do you have that up and ready to go? Yes, you do. I see your yep. cursor in there, and we are just going. Yep, to... it's one of these tabs. <laughs> it's one of those. Well, I see your cursor, no. but yeah. So we're just going to kind of go back and forth, and some of these are class related, and some of them are very much class related. And we're going to start with question number one, McBurney. The question for you: Why? Why not? There you go. Off with a humdinger right there. Next question. Are there courses? That was actually the question, by the way. That was the entire is, question was why. Was why, yeah. And then why not is the appropriate answer to that. Exactly. All right. Are there other courses at UVA you would suggest for someone interested in software development? Uh, we've seen the version of this question in Discord as well, and people ask some of our guest speakers. I know this. Um, McBurney, what do you think? What are the first ones that pop into your head that are good for folks who are interested in um, Well, it, I mean... So it depends if like there is a there is a uh, uh, if you want to do app development, I think we have an app development class, right? Dedicated there's app development class. class. Um, there's software testing, mm -hmm. which that goes a lot more in depth into the verification validation stuff, including automated testing techniques, etc. Uh, there is um, there's like a, a web uh, web, web PL? yeah web PL Robbie web, web programming language. Uh, I'm actually, you know, I'm still learning. I, I, I don't remember what electives there are that are that's super fair. relevant just because I've, I've been here two years and a year and a half of that has been in my basement. Yeah, I know. I know. We're sorry. Um, so so number one, honestly, you know, I, I think databases is a good thing for everyone to have. I mean, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's hard to not run into a software system where you're going to have to deal with data management in some way. And I, I will admit, I, look. Prof and Matrapong and Bossit are fantastic. I taught databases for a very long time, very long time. It was actually the very first course that I taught here. And you know who was in my very first section of databases that I taught when I came to UVA? Mark Florian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and guess what? He still didn't have hair. Um, so uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, I, it, it, it's not the hardest class we teach. I'm just going to be honest. It's not. But but it, it, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to have experience in. Uh, mobile app is good. Um, uh, Graham's been teaching that for a while. I'll probably be back to teaching. I mean, a lot of y'all are half of y'all are second years. I mean, I don't know about represented on this call, but in the class this semester, half of the class are second years. And so um, uh, I hopefully will be back teaching mobile. Not this fall, but the next fall. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's right. So fall of twenty two. Fall of 22, I'm hopefully teaching mobile and game design. That's my that's my hope. That's my hope and prayer. Mm -hmm. But I don't know yet. Um, so those are good. And testing, like McMurney said, and, and WebPL, those are both good as well. So, Will, you want to ask the next question? Sure. Um, what drew you to teaching slash becoming a professor? Well, for me, uh, I'm from a family of teachers. Like, mm. my wife is a librarian. My mother is a teacher. My mother in law is a teacher. My father in law is a college professor. My sister is a math teacher. My brother in law is a history teacher. I mean, teaching is just what's there. And frankly, I didn't want to keep doing research. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like teaching. I think teaching's fun. Yeah. Uh, what drew me to it? I, I think, you know, I. All right. Follow me on this. Being a teacher, being a good teacher, is like being a good dungeon master because you are creating experiences that you are having people go through and you're trying to tell a coherent story from beginning to end. You meet for a certain number of hours a week. Go, people go home and work on their character sheets. 
<laughs> what what's the dice roll in this metaphor? <laughs> My grading. <laughs> no. Um. What about you? All right. So uh, this is this is a tangent, but it's a relevant one. Um. So when when students ask me, "Hey, should I go to grad school?" There's a few reasons I tell them not to go to grad school. One is don't go to grad school just because you think you want more college. Mm. Like just the experience of being in college, because it turns out that when you have money, you can kind of recreate a lot of those experiences much more nicely. Um, but also don't go like just because, oh, I'm not I don't really love all these job offers. So let me go deeper in debt to uh, to to go to grad school to see if I get better job offers. So anyway, I went to grad school because I didn't like my job offer. So I figured, why not go deeper into debt and see if I can get better job offers? And um <laughs> Anyway, but no, seriously, like I didn't, I had uh, finished undergrad, no aspirations of teaching, didn't even really know what a, like, I mean, I knew what a PhD was, but I didn't know the, like, the process of a PhD. I didn't understand really yeah. even research from a standpoint of what it meant uh, in, in grad school for research. And I, I started doing my master's and I started teaching uh, in, as my assistantship for my first year of my master's. I taught a class at uh, West Virginia University, and it was in Microsoft Office, of all things, Excel and Access. And I loved it. I fell in love with it. And I just not 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 Access and, and Excel, although okay, I will but, say I, I am in love with Excel. Excel is wonderful. OK, Access, yeah, access is a, just a no, no, not even that. Access yeah, is just a, an abomination. Access is for people who can't realize that learning SQL is easier than using Access. Um, but no, um, so I, I, nonetheless, we still had it because we had, we had the business school and a lot of them were doing database stuff and they didn't really have a databases class. So they were actually pushing students in the business school at WV to access at the time. Anyway, um, but I fell in love with it. I really fell in love with teaching and I decided that's what I was going to do. And so that was my goal. Getting a PhD was the, the whole way through was, was, was teaching I actually had an assistantship at Notre Dame, which let me teach a class at Notre Dame uh, while I was there, which the big thing there is there, the, the university is very adverse to grad student teaching. Um, we had to trick them into letting me teach. Um, which, had to trick us too, but we don't tell that story. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, no, I, I have some photographs anyway. Um, <laughs> and and that was how Will McBurney got fired. <laughs> But no, so I, I just fell in love with teaching because I just had to do it because I wanted to eat food that month. Mm. And um, I tend to be pro food. Yeah. Well, also Civilization Five came out. I had to buy. I had to buy. Oh, okay. Well, well, speaking of games, let's jump right. Let's get to that next yeah. question for you. Ask by Kieran. What was the first video game you ever owned? What was the first video game I ever owned? This is tough because I'm the youngest sibling and my brother's like five years older than me. And I know my grandparents had an NES. And I remember playing, it'd be like Tetris and Nintendo Golf and Donkey Kong, the arcade version, not like Super Nintendo Donkey Kong, um, on the NES. But I don't really remember because it was it, it was very early. I mean, my earliest memories, I remember I was playing video games i remember like um as a family like my dad my dad my grandparents um my parents like so i was uh this was with like my dad's family like, i remember a few of us were over in his parents house and like they had a family room basement and we were all like watching them play super nintendo uh super mario world because we rented and uh, super nintendo and i just remember that was a thing that we did god i'm old I think mine yeah. was Congo Bongo for the Commodore 64. <laughs> yeah, I know. I never had a Commodore 64, but yeah, I don't know. So, if mine I mean, was the... Good. I was gonna say I don't. I can't remember if mine was the. Com... I don't remember which came first because it's so old. Was mm -hmm. it my Commodore 64 or my Sears video game Master System, which was yeah. a clone of an Intellivision? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, next. Uh, oh, before you were a professor teaching at UVA. How was your experience working at your previous careers? That's going to be awkward for me. Um, 
I'm going to get an internship, but I don't know whether I should focus on the hardware side or software side more. All right. So first, and I'm pretty sure it's the same for Jeff. Uh, I've never had outside of summer internships. I've never had a full time industry job. I was a kind of had a job at IBM while I was finishing my PhD mm -hmm. because I was doing my PhD work on a project that I was working at. So I guess technically it was a co op. Mm -hmm. But we, yeah, we don't have other careers. We like, I, I'm always jealous of people like, not jealous, but jealous might not be the right word. But like, if you ever, ever talked to Ray about his, like Ray Pettit. Oh, for, yeah, for yeah. It's like, yeah, I was a college dropout. Then I went into the military. Then I was a software developer. Then I went back to school. Then I got my PhD. He's like, oh, yeah, I'm I was just doing VR things for, for pilots. And then he's talking about like how he's making a simulator for the space shuttle landing and how he's. Like someone in the back of the room keeps saying, it needs to do this. It needs to do that. And then after he's like, wow, you were kind of being a dick. Like, what, what, why did you keep correcting? It's like, oh, yeah, because I, I just I came down on the I came down on the space shuttle like a couple months ago. And so I just wanted to tell you what it was like so you could add that in. It was an astronaut that just happened to be, you know, picking apart his software. And yeah. I'm like, why can't I? Have <laughs> well, yeah, because I chose this career path like straight away. Yeah, so I, I was excited when we came up with Gamebox for 1110. Like, that was my excitement. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, no. Um, I, so, I pretty much knew right away in grad school that this is what I wanted to do. So I didn't really pursue anything else. But I'll say this. For the, for the question in particular, you don't know whether to focus on hardware or soft, software. For an internship, don't matter. Honestly, it don't matter. I mean, for an internship, you want the experience of being in a mm -hmm. team engineering environment. What you are actually building almost doesn't matter because actually I'll say it doesn't matter because in many cases that the experience is going to be with the people and the environment, not the actual project. So I wouldn't worry about the project. Yeah, and I did do, can, can I actually jump down a bit to a related question, which yeah, is how did you, uh, how are you most it? software development oh. jobs in the industry working alone or in teams, in teams, in teams, in teams, in teams, in teams. <laughs> Only um, if you are like literally a one person shop working by yourself. Mm -hmm. And even then you still have to interact with other people. Yeah. Teamwork is like that. This was um, maybe this was a question that comes up later and I'm, I'm preempting it, but like, this is arguably this soft skill of teamwork and sharing the burden of a large project that is so large. One person can't do it. That soft skill is the most important skill from this class. Mm -hmm. um, and I know for a fact there are people in here who learned more about themselves yes. on your team. Because you, you, I, I had meetings with, with students who said people weren't doing their job and I took it on myself to do it. And now seeing the semester and I realize, oh my God, I can't do that in real life. And I'm like, mission accomplished for the class. I mean, I hate that you did that extra work, but mm -hmm. you know, so. um, I mean, so the other... You know, how long did you stay in your first job out of college? I've been at UVA for 17 years. <laughs> so I would say, and this no, that's is not right. 14 years. I don't know. How long do we count March 2020? That has to count. Yeah, that, that was at least four years. At least four years. Yeah. And then the election. My God, that was like a decade and a half, no, no, give or take. Let's not. No, okay. Um, all right. So, well. Here, here is how I would answer that. As someone who recent, relatively recently changed jobs. Oh, that's a good aspect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say stay at your job as long as you're um, finding that it is, like, I, I don't, I don't, there is a lot of, I have a friend who, uh, who went to WV with me and he's worked at like every big company on the West Coast and he moves jobs every like two or three years. And it works for him and he's fine with that. And okay, I couldn't do that. Um, mm -hmm. But I could also say that two years into my first job, I decided for, for a number of reasons that I needed a change of scenery. One biggest one is just I'm from West Virginia and I was living in Philadelphia. So, so let that sink in, in terms of the, the, um, you know, the the how 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 densely populated my hometown is and Philadelphia, which is, you know, with the fifth fifth biggest city in the country or something. Anyway, sure. That was a big part of it. There were other kind of career goals that I felt that I wasn't going to be able to reach in my position. And so, yeah, I, 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 I changed jobs. I'm very happy here. I, I love Charlottesville. I love the university. 
So like, uh, if you ask me today, I would say I plan to spend the rest of my career here, you know? Um, so it, it, it just, it, it really depends on you and your situation. What I would say is one, you need a job. You do, you do need a job, but that, but you don't need just the job that you're in. So if, if it is, if it is causing you substantial personal dissatisfaction, it, it can be worth looking elsewhere, but yeah. you know, I have I mean, a plan. Yeah. To that point in 20, I think it was 2014. I went on the market and I got a job offer at Carnegie Mellon. And uh, I, I, I remember the look on our department chair's face when I told him I had a competing offer um, or like an offer to leave. And the, the look of panic was hopefully what, what, what sparked some of the, oh, we need to hire more teaching faculty because Mark's about to lose his mind. <laughs> so yeah. um, I want to merge my career into the data side of things, ultimately with data science and even machine learning. Do you see any crossover between software engineering and the data side of computer science? I mean, no matter what code you are writing, you want to do it so other people can maintain it. And from at, at its core, software engineering is how do you work well on teams and create maintainable software? So, yes. Mm -hmm. there, <laughs> I mean, certainly the type of code you're writing is different. Like a lot of data scientists are going to be writing scripts mm -hmm. on a data set that are, you know, you kind of have your library of scripts that you're running. You're probably not going to be writing a ton of really intricate user interfaces or things like that, probably. Mm -hmm. So like the UI stuff is not there, but this, the principles of testing. I mean, think about this for a second. You probably want to know how to do testing before you run a script on millions of lines of, of records mm -hmm. because it might take a long time for that to run. So, yeah. I don't know. Do you have any other thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would also say, and this kind of gets into a bit of a research question later, but there was there's a lot of, you know, when I when I started working with the professor I worked with at, at WVU, it was so data intensive that I didn't realize it was like predominantly software engineering research because it was hmm. most of what I was doing research wise was actually would fall under probably either the AI or machine learning. Well, my, mine specifically was AI, but there were some machine learning algorithms that I, I utilized. Uh, but the one the my unique contribution one was technically not a machine learning algorithm. Oh, um, in your opinion, what are the best languages topics that are not taught at UVA that should or could be learned on your own? Organizational skills. That that is time management. Yeah, time management and organizational skills. Um, and I know that's like the low hanging fruit, but it is it is absolutely true. I can say that I struggled with it a lot. Um, I think I've mentioned before I am ADHD. And especially with organizational skills, that is a struggle. Um, I can say that I spent a lot of time developing and forcing myself to use mechanisms that were organizational. And I understand that my basement right now is a mess and that that doesn't seem to suggest that I'm organized. But I'm organized on the things that I need to be organized on, even if generally I'm not. Yeah. So, yeah. like, that is the most important thing, organizational skills and time management. And I, and I call one the other. Because if you're disorganized, you're not going to use your time effectively. So I, I will toss out, I, I think probably, Zach, the, the question asked here, is, is asking about technical things, um, where I completely agree that the soft skill is actually probably more important than learning any particular languages or topics, honestly. Because once you get the soft skills, then you can do the, mm -hmm. the technical stuff. Um, I, honestly, right now, if I was to pick a language, a technical thing, JavaScript, we don't do as much in the department and JavaScript yeah. as horrible, horrible a language as it is, it still runs a lot of the internet and runs a yeah. lot of applications. <laughs> and also I'll, learning, I'll, although, although I'm, I'm pretty sure this is covered in, in PL, um, also learning Lisp makes you a better programmer. It, may make, it makes I, your code, no. it makes it easier to be functional in my mind. You disagree? I think it makes it easier to drive yourself insane, but sure. Uh, well, while you're working on Lisp. Oh, geez. Okay. I, I don't use Lisp, but having learned it, my programs are more functional. Okay. Sure. I'll go with that. 
Hey, hey, Will. Yeah. Will Chloe Soft have any internship opportunities this summer? Let me let me ask the CEO. Oh. <laughs> oh, she, she's uh she's currently she's currently uh uh in, in on a phone on a very important phone call. Sorry. Um so you'll have to come back later and ask. Um what is it like to do research in computer science? Um so let, let's answer this two different ways. Computer science really, unlike some fields, will branch into two very different types of research. And one of them is your very technical research. So it's like, I wrote a new algorithm. I'm going to put it on this computer and I'm going to run it. And I'm going to have a stopwatch. Don't use a stopwatch. And I'm going to see how fast it go. That's one type of algorithm. Or that's one type of research. Another type of research that I do, and I think, I don't know about you, McBurney, but the type of research that I do is human behavior research. Mm -hmm. So educational research falls under the category of social and behavioral sciences. And so we have actually have like an internal review board, the IRB, where we have to, when we propose a project, we have to show that we're not, you know, shocking people, like hurting people. We have to show that there's a reason for doing a particular teaching technique. And that, that way we can, mm -hmm. what are we mitigating risks or things like that? So if you're, if you're in the technical researchy side in computer science, you're in the hardware side, it's like a, I mean, it's just a job, you know, you, you kind of go in, you, you're, you, you try some things, you meet with your advisor, you meet with your co-researchers, you try out new things, you go down the path, you, you know, good scientific method, right? You come up mm -hmm. with a theory, you design an experiment, you know, all that stuff. If you're more social behavioral sciences stuff, if you're doing like human computer interaction, like if you're testing, why do some interfaces work one way than the other? Uh, it gets a wee bit more complex and you have mm -hmm. to start finding more. And y'all saw this with doing beta testing. That's there's even more steps than that. Um, but it is very um, propose a study, come up with a hypothesis, design the study, test it, rinse, repeat. Yeah. And I, and I would say that one of the, one of the biggest things that I respect now as a researcher is that um Right now, admittedly, I think there's a little bit of a of a p hacking crisis. P hacking being, um, you basically you do whatever it takes to find some number p less than 0 0.05, which means oh. you have a, a significant <laughs> finding. And yeah. it, it basically it means that you find two populations where rated against some criteria, the 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 chance that they're different strictly because of randomization is five percent or less and the problem is is i think that does lead to a lot of bad interpretations of of data yeah. and, and a lot of it leads to a lot of very quick rapid fire things that aren't replicable either um so i I've, I've kind of been a bit just enchanted i would say by um my research area which was uh the software engineering research area specifically ICSI. i think there's a lot of p hacking emphasis there um, uh, no, none of my ICSI friends will see this. Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> yeah, and well, I mean, my advisor wrote a blog, like wrote a blog post that was seen by plenty of people, which said exactly the same thing. I mean, that it's, um, and so like, good insightful findings that don't meet this threshold don't get published, and questionably replicable findings are, and and. And so that that can be a bit of an issue. What I would say is I, I definitely have gained a lot more appreciation for when I look at uh, reporting on a scientific study, really oh. spending a lot of time thinking about the threats to validity. The idea yes. is, and this is actually something that when you write a paper, you write in the paper, hey, here's all the reasons the study could be bullshit. Like, here's all the reasons it could be wrong. And that's important to do because as a scientific thinker, you need to always be self-critical. You should never say, I've mm. discovered this idea. This must be the way things are, especially when you're relating to human behavior, which actually, even though I was software engineering, my research was very much in how humans read and comprehend code. And so there's there's huge threats to validity there. Um, you want to pick the next one? Yeah. Um, hang on. We're, where getting down we? to the end. We're getting down toward the end, folks. Okay. So if there's other questions you have, you can post them in chat. Uh, and I'm just making sure we didn't miss any. And we still have a surprise or something coming up. Who knows? Who knows? Okay. 
Uh, I'll go ahead and jump to the last one because I think this is always a good question. So do empl- so there, this is a two-part question. So the first part is, do employers really care about transcripts? And the second part is, and I'm going to try to anonymize it as much as I can, uh, someone is considering in a course uh, just accepting a GC instead of a CR. That is a general credit rather than a credit because um, they are burnt out motivation at a low and they're not really sure how much the GCCR matters. So yeah. I guess the first thing that we would honestly have to say is we don't know. Not and, the transcript part, the GR yeah. versus this. Yeah, that, the GR versus CR part. Well, the only thing that we know for certain about it is that GC doesn't meet prerequisite standards and CR does. But as far as how employers or even grad schools will interpret that, we don't know. And and so this is because there's not like a point in recent history where we can look back and say, well, you know, you know, after X event happened for the rest of the term, students could go pass fail. That is not something that I am aware of at all happening. Uh, on a large scale. I mean, I know, yep. I know it's like, uh, you know, I would have students at Penn since I taught the intro class take it past fail because they were just wanting to learn the skill. They weren't really trying to advance in the field. Um, but I don't know even what that meant for their transcripts since they weren't really a technical field. And, it, and, and, and my bet is a lot of recruiters don't know how they want to interpret it yet. I, <laughs> I mean, if, if I'm That's completely probably true, honest, because they, they're, they are trying to figure out, okay, if we don't have let like you know our traditional metrics, which by the way, I think there's a lot of flaws with the traditional metrics. But I, I will also say in, in CS, there's been a, a big shift towards looking at things like portfolio over. I mean, not to say your GPA doesn't matter. Certainly your GPA right. matters. Like if you have a 1.7, probably not going to work at Facebook, right? Um, but they're gonna want to look at your portfolio especially and see what you've done and if someone has like basically no portfolio and a 4.0 versus someone with like a 3.6 who has a great portfolio 3.6 is significantly better in that context than the 4.0 yeah. student significantly so the the exact gpa matters less than you think it does not to say it doesn't matter but it matters less than you think it does you know there's when it comes down to it, no one's going to be like, oh, well, this person has a 3.71, but this person has a 3.72. And if a company does do that, chances are they also evaluate their employees in the same way and you probably don't want to work. <laughs> um, so, so in my experience, yeah, I, no, I completely agree with all that. I, I, in my experience, when I've talked to recruiters, it's kind of gone this way. Step one, did you graduate? Move to step two. For step, <laughs> if you graduated, step two, the, okay, you got that degree, great. Then what they do is they look at what courses did you have? Mm-hmm. And that's what starts the conversation. It's, you know, if we're looking for someone that has had experience in X, Y, or Z, have you had courses in that? Then they look at the grade or they look at, you know, so you got software engineering. So I got, got an A. Okay. Well, I know that a lot of people get A's in, in 3240. It's the truth. It just, it, it does happen. So they'll say, well, we, you know, can you show us something? You, it, it's the prompt to look for more information. So if you took a GC in, I'm going to pick something theory of computation, because it's theory. Um, then you know, okay, it's theory. They probably ask any questions because it's theory. Uh, we pick another one. Um, uh, com- computer architecture. They might say, you know, they might ask you another question to see what your your level of learning is. But at the end of the day, I don't think it matters as much. Um, so, so there's, I got a follow up question as a private message in Zoom, which is for a technical interview. Then, how elaborate do the projects need to be? It's all about the story you're trying to tell, Mm -hmm. right? It's, this is my career path. This is what I'm interested in. Here is an artifact I can show you that tries to talk about that. So maybe you want to go into, if you're for the, here for the talk on Tuesday, maybe you want to do biz dev type stuff. Well, then maybe you talk about in my 3240 project, you don't talk about, Hey, look, I did some cool Django stuff. You say, I was really interested in the requirements part and the testing part. It's, it's how, it's all how you spin it. Mm -hmm. So how technical the projects need to be, how elaborate. I mean, I think there's a certain critical mass that they, they need to be at least so like complex. Uh, Like if you, if you show tic-tac-toe, they're probably going to be like, all right, moving on. Okay. Fair. But, but, but it's not, 
there's again, it, it's it's like once you reach kind of like a critical level of like, OK, this is reasonably complex and and feature robust. It has a lot of different intermoving parts at that point. It, it almost it, it almost doesn't matter how much more complex it gets. And that touches on the next question we actually had on the sheet, which is what type of personal pro- coding projects stand out on a resume? I think we kind of answered that one, too. Mm-hmm. Hey, Will, do you stream on Twitch? Uh, I actually haven't really lately. Uh, so I have I have two Twitch accounts. One was what I used to teach back when they're just like scrambling, like whatever you can do, do it uh, la- last spring uh, 2020. Um, that was Professor underscore McBurney. I do have a, a personal Twitch. I haven't really streamed on it much lately, though. I thought you're still streaming some of your hots matches. I so I haven't so I was casting, but I just I haven't had the time. Oh, yeah. uh, and and having not had the time, I've also kind of lost a lot of the interest. For context, the game hasn't been patched since the beginning of March. It is it is hardcore maintenance mode now. Like Blizzard has just pretty much pulled everyone off of that and StarCraft and to mm-hmm. to put it all into um Diablo 4 and Overwatch 2. So I streamed Hearthstone for I streamed Hearthstone for a bit. Mm-hmm. And what I was trying to do was I was trying to see if I could stream a game while also talking about some of the game design decisions in the game. And I was going to make it part of when I was teaching game design that like that would be some of the lectures would be being playing a game, talking about it. And I actually made some videos of this of me like going through the very first level of Super Mario Brothers 1 and talking about the game design decisions and the very mm. and the intro of Link to the Past and then I was just I it's too much effort. I just yeah. haven't been able to do it. So, I used to. Um so I think that is all of the questions all the that, questions we got in the Google form anyway. All the questions we got in the Google form. Here I've got I think this is the sheet yeah, this is this is the sheet. If you are interested in TA, um, I did promise a surprise. Uh, Mick Bernie, yeah, will you please uh, go out your front door and look down? There is. Is there something in front of my door? Okay. All right. This is this this feels like it's going to be a bomb. Just say. <laughs> we'll pause for a moment. We'll see if he actually. I uh, hope it's still there. It probably is. As we all wait with bated breath. Maybe his wife found okay. it. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I should note, Sheriff. Sheriff, I, I have told Sheriff where I live. He didn't like stalk me or anything. He also lives not far. Not enough. far. Not yeah. far. Yeah. Um, okay. Should I open it now? Yeah, go for it. Now, did they, everyone see what it was? It was a question. Oh, yeah. Why? The Mario question block, but my my head's a bit sore, so I'm not going to open it the old fashioned way. All right, let's see. Um, I have to cut some tape in there, I guess. Yeah. I, I by the way, I, I honestly, sincerely did not know this was coming. So that's why it's called a surprise. Yeah. Why well, I'm saying it's not just a surprise for the students. Um, of course, nothing's going to happen at the two o'clock. You ain't getting two. Yeah, that's true. Maybe, well, just give me another package now. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> There's no tape on the bottom. Did I really tape it that hard? I guess I did. Well, it's the tape on the bottom that's holding the, the box shape together is also on the box itself. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I apologize. But I'm, I'll try to reassemble it because I think it'll be a cool little decoration. But it shouldn't be too difficult go. to put back together. All right. A lot of untaping going on here. It was popping open. I wasn't trying to go overboard. Oh, no, 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 no. No, it's fine. <laughs> Well, for, I, I will say that for not trying, you put together a pretty damn good effort. Um, okay. Here we go. Let's see. All right. So, Mug, let me try to open this as safely as I can. Cut that. Cut that. Cut the. No, 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 no. Don't pull it. Cut, cut that. Yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, just rip that sticker off. Okay, I see, I see. It comes... I see, I see. It's a tight... Yeah. Now, the tab is... I apparently... The, the, I, I need to take a college course in opening boxes. Opening boxes, 1110. Oh, lovely! 
uh, six, here, sixy mug. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. There, there's a couple other things in that big, big box. Okay. All right. Let me take a look here. Uh, yeah, take out the take out the paper and hand oh, it. To here Corey. we go. Oh, this is nice. I can put these on my shelf in my little game space area. Nice. My, I think that's it. That is it. Yes. Thank you. You're very Thank welcome. You. Oh, here I will hang on. Hang out, like, fall like, out in the X-wing. They're like this big back there. That's fine. It's just funny. They'll hang out between Fallout and the X-wing. There we go. There you go. Awesome. Thank you for being an awesome partner this year. Thank it you. has been. I, it has been an absolute pleasure. It has. It has. Uh, I have. I have felt that I have learned a lot from you for this year. So thank well, you that's very, very much. Kind. Thank you so much for joining us this week. If you haven't had a chance to. Uh, subscribe on the podcast service of your choice. Head to Apple Podcasts, Anchor FM, RegradeRequest.com, wherever it is. Subscribe. Send us a review. We would love to get your reviews, love to get your feedback. Hosts at RegradeRequest.com. Take care, stay safe, and watch for Falling Ghosts. See you next time. Bye.